Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic. I'm joined by this guy, my co-host, Dr. Matt, 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 Matt Oh, good start. Matu Batu. How I think are it's because you? you never call me by my name. It's usually Benjamin or Franklin. Or, yeah. So when you actually try to say it, you get it wrong. Joey Jojo Shabadoo Jr. Uh, Matt, you are here. I'm um, here. I've turned up today. To everybody's chagrin, including my own. How are you? Well, not too bad. Yeah. I do want to mention uh, that we had a colleague and a close friend yeah. who passed this week, Amy, Dr. Amy Johnson. So I, I did want to just mention that and express that she played a very important role in our lives. Yep. If it wasn't for Amy, I wouldn't be doing this. Probably myself as well. I When I finished my PhD, I got a job at Griffith in Gold Coast, Queensland, and essentially I took... Amy's job. Yeah. So Amy was doing the sciences within the nursing program and she got a clinical role, I think, in Brisbane. And so I kind of fitted into her position and she was lovely. She helped me with um, all the legwork. Yeah. So she provided all the material for me, you know, spent a lot of time. And then over the years... We did a lot of research together. I mean, including you as well. Yeah, don't forget me. I was there. (laughs) And so she was great. And, uh, yeah, she had a battle with breast cancer. She did wonderfully well, though, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she got a couple of trips to India. She went overseas multiple times. But, yeah, Amy, uh, yeah, super important to me. She gave me my very first teaching gig. So when I first started... I was doing my PhD. She asked me if I wanted to do some teaching. I said, sure. She, I remember her saying, I need somebody to run a, gas, a, a gastrointestinal tract or digestive system lab. Yeah. Can you do it? I went, yeah, of course I can. And it had been years since I'd studied that. So I spent the whole weekend studying for it, went to the labs, and it was, the, it was you know awesome. That's where I fell in love with teaching. And then uh, I taught as much as I possibly could for Amy. And then when she went on her secondment, she asked me if I could uh, teach continuing at Griffith, and I did. And it's that it's been, well, 11, 12 years since then. So there you go. So, Amy, we miss you. Yeah, and to her family, friends, um, we're thinking of you. Absolutely. So, Matt, today... Yes. So uh, today's long form. Long form. And we're doing podcast. a system we're doing a system today. And yep. I don't think we've covered this system at all in our how long have we been going for? Five years, six years? Seven years. Seven no, not quite. We started in twenty sixteen. Seventeen, eighty nine. No, I think seventeen. Two, two, two. Anyway. No, nah, twenty sixteen. So let's say six years. Okay, seven years. <laughs> yeah. We haven't done this system. We haven't done this system. Um, and it's probably because there's a lot to cover. Uh, and uh, we thought, all right, let's do it. We did the male reproductive system. I think also um, to do the female. Two dudes doing this system sometimes seems yeah, a bit odd. It does. <laughs> it does. And we fully are aware of that fact that you're going to have two blokes talking about the female reproductive system. But just so you know, this is something that we lecture uh, at university to uh, health students. So this is an area that we can speak about. Uh, Mind you, as we talk about this, we will be using the term female reproductive tract and female reproductive system and female reproductive organs. But please note that we use that for simplicity's sake, that we are identifying, at least in our case, a difference here between gender and sex. And what we're basically saying is individuals who were determined or identified as female at birth or recognised as female at birth... um, who are having predominantly what people generally call female reproductive structures and organs. That's how we're referring to it as. So we're not saying that all individuals that recognise as female have these structures, but again, for simplicity's sake, we're going to be referring to it as the female reproductive system, organs, structures, and so forth, just like we did in the male reproductive system. Uh, And look, there's a lot to go through. We've got the anatomy. We've got the physiology, and a lot of that has to do with the menstrual cycle, uh, which is the sexual reproductive cycle, but also fertilization, what happens with the eggs, implantation. There's a whole bunch to go through, Matt, and uh, we should probably just jump into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Where where are we going to start? Let's start with anatomy. All right. 
And so with the anatomy, the anatomy of the female reproductive system can be broken into internal structures and external structures. Yeah. So actually, the, probably the first thing we should say is what is a, you might come across the term, a primary sex or primary reproductive organ. Yep. So what that refers to is the structure that directly produces gametes. So gametes are sex cells. Sex cells. And so, what's so, the, so what's a sex cell? A sex cell would be a cell that would allow the individual to reproduce. Right. So in a male, that would be the sperm or spermatogonia. Yep. And for the female, that would be the ovum or the egg or the oogonia. Or the oocyte. Or the oocyte. Yeah. And so in terms of the primary sex organ or primary sex uh, structure, we would say that in this today's context would be the ovary. Yes, yes. Which is probably going to be, so if we were to maybe for simplicity's sake to help orientate people, it's sort of the testes equivalent. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And there's going to be a lot of similarities obviously uh, and Matt I'm sure we'll talk about embryology. Yeah, that will come into it probably towards the end. Oh, great. But I think we well, covered we the anatomy no f- left. Cover, <laughs> cover the anatomy first so mm-hmm. we've got a baseline understanding of what the anatomy is. Yep. And then we'll talk about how the biological sex determination or differentiation occurred embryologically. Yeah. So our body's made up of 30 trillion different cells, right? And each of those cells pretty much nearly all of them have DNA inside of them, right? And they have 23 pairs of chromosomes from one to 23 and they're pairs because you got one from mum, one from dad all the way through your 23 pairs. Yep. Uh, now the thing is that your all the, so even your skin cells will have that, but your skin cells don't allow for you to reproduce. So you don't take a skin cell and pass it off to your offspring, right? Okay, yeah. But you do take a sex cell and pass it off to your offspring. So you take a sperm cell, which has your DNA, send it, it mixes with an egg, an oocyte, it recombines and it produces an offspring that has one chromosome from you, one chromosome from your partner, and then that's how it sort of goes ad infinitum until the end of the human species. Uh, (laughs) But that's what we mean by sex cell. Yeah. Sperm and egg. And the sperm seems to be one of the smaller cells in the body and the egg is the largest. The largest. Yes. At one point, the and we'll get there, the uh, oocyte or the ovum, once it's now ovulated, is around about 1.5 centimetres in size. Wow. That's so pretty you, big. You can see it with a naked eye. Yeah. So it's, ba- it's, it's I would say probably on average it's about the size of a full stop. Okay. On a page. Yeah. yeah. But a sperm you're not going to see with the naked no. eye. All right. All right. Good, good, good. Okay, good, good. Uh, internal anatomy, you want to go So let's just, let's just go through the structures that are internal and then the right. structures that are external just by name. Okay. And then I'll quickly introduce what the terms mean. Right. And then we'll go through bit by bit. So the internal structures are the ovaries, which are the, pri- the primary sex organ for yep. the female. Then we have the secondary sex organs, which are the fallopian tubes. Now, actually, I'll just go with the fallopian tubes at this point, but we'll come back to what maybe a better term is. Okay. We've got the uterus, and then the lower part of the uterus is the cervix. I guess you could also argue that the the vagina will be also internal. Yep. But then you go to the external anatomy, and that would include the labia, which is plural here, yep. including the, the smaller and the larger well, labia. You could first start by saying the vaginal opening, since you finished it, the okay. internal yep. aspect of the vagina. But yes. The clitoris, the mons, and the vulva, which kind of encompass this is the more, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Happy with that? Yep. yep. Okay. So in terms of the terms. So you've so we've got ovaries, we've got fallopian tubes, which you're going to tell us what the uh, probably most appropriate term is shortly, the uterus, the um, cervix, the vagina, then the vaginal opening, then the labia, and there's labia majora, labia majora, uh, labia minora, labia majora, the clitoris, uh, the uh, vestibule, which we haven't said? Well, the vestibule is just kind of the inner part of the, the labia minora. So okay. The inner, well, the labia minora kind of would put the boundary of the vestibule. And oh. That's the opening for where the, internal, the external urethral orifice and the vaginal orifice mm. would open into the vestibule. All right, so should we orientate people for the external anatomy or do you want to go through something first? Start with the internal. Okay. But let's get the terms, what they mean All right. in definition first. So let's start with the ovary. What would you suggest, what would you expect this term to mean? Well, I play footy on an oval 
and it's the shape of a uh, oval. <laughs> so is there some etymological basis there? About yeah, I think shape? so. I think shape, ovary, um, derives from egg. Okay. So particularly bird egg. Right. So you're right. So the ovary would come from ovarium, which is a Latin-based term, and it pretty much just means the egg of something called egg of the bird, which okay. is an oval shape. So I'm guessing it's either coming in one direction. Yeah. Or maybe the, the other. Yeah, the oval came from the ovary. Yeah. Or, or, or the ova or the egg. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's what ovary means. Right. Now, floping tubes named after the person. Yeah. Johnny Fallopia. Yeah, basically. I don't know his first name, but an Italian anatomist. He named a couple of things. There's a, something else called the fallopian. Yeah, I can't remember the I can't remember what it is. So it's probably not the best term. We go away from these terms now in anatomy because yep. they're not overly descriptive. Yeah. So some of the terms that you could use in place of the fallopian tubes is the over, overduct. Okay. Um, or the salpinx. I call them uterine tubes. Or the uterine tubes. Yeah. Isn't yep. uterine tubes the most common? Probably now, yeah. Yeah. Overduct um, definitely maybe in comparative anatomy. Yep. But, um, yeah, I think you're right. The uterine tubes is better. Mm. Sometimes anatomically, or sorry, from a pathological standpoint, you might encounter salpingitis or part of the hysterectomy yep. procedure of taking out the ovaries and the fallopian tubes in the uterus yep. would encompass the removal of the salping. Ectomy, I think, yep. or ov, ov, which is the egg, oh, sorry, the ovary, and the sal pinks ectomy, the removal of those structures. Words are difficult for you, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But the, the Latin term sal pinks yep. just means trumpet. Oh. So the shape of the, the tubes yeah. would look, got a, got a widened top end, looks like the trumpets that were used. So is the widened end uh, the opening for the uterus or is the widened end the fimbrae, no. the fingers? Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. So were the, the fimbrae and the Did you mention the, the fimbrae when you went through the internal anatomy? No, but that's just part of the, uh, what did you call it? Uterine tubes. Uterine tubes, there we go. So you've got the ovary, then you've got the uterine tubes and the fimbrae, which is if the uterine tubes are the arm, the fimbrae is the hand and the fingers. That's right. And the ovary is sort of sitting really close to those fingers because it's important because the ovary is going to ovulate an egg Correct. that the fimbrae will pull into the uterine tubes. And if you travel through those uterine tubes, you get to the uterus. So what's the etymology of the uterus? The, the Latin based would be womb. Womb, okay, yeah. because but, that's what it is. But the Greek, which is a bit more controversial, Oh, okay. this would be a hy hysteria. Right, Or hysterix, yes. I think. Yes. So that would... Be more. How are you? What? Oh, can I? I need to tell you something really funny. So I was uh, I was on Twitter, which I don't do as often as I used to, for probably obvious reasons. And somebody was telling a story about about their partner, um, their husband, becoming hysterical about something. But they didn't use the term hysterical. They said testerical, because obviously the hiss part yeah. is referring to the uterus and has horrible etymological origins mm. about, oh, she's being hysterical, you know, it's a woman thing, it's uterus-driven. And so she said he was becoming hysterical, so she called it testerical. And I thought it was a great use of that term, sort of like the male equivalent of hysterical. So I'm going to start using testerical for well, you. Well, it probably be more accurate to say prosterical. Prosterical. Yeah. Because part of the prostate was the uterus. If you, yeah, yeah, okay. Whereas the testes is more ovary. Yeah, prosterical. I like it. I like it. All right, so, uh, all right, so we've got. Well, that's that. a good thing to do. Um, so we've got the oh, uterus. Oh, question. Yeah. In uh, uh, Serbian, yeah. <laughs> what is the term for bucket or, ba or barrel? I don't know. Have you. Vedro? Okay. I don't think I've no. ever said it. Okay. That's apparently the. Derivative coming from the Slavic basis. Vedro. Vedro, which means bucket or barrel, which can then go down the line of the uterus. So uterus and vedro seem to have yes. origins together, yeah. even though they sound so different. That's right. Oh, okay. 
So we've got the uterus. This is the site that the egg implants once it's fertilised and this yep. is the site where it will grow, develop, nourish, the placenta will embed and the developing embryo will continue to mature and grow. That's right. All right. So, But then if we were to continue uh, through the uterus and go to the opening or the neck of the uterus. So the neck, yes. Yeah, so the cervix is just means neck, like right. cervical region of your back. Okay, so you got... Your cervi- the tebral column. So your cervix of your neck, yeah. you've got cervical vertebrae and so forth, and you've also got the cervix of the uterus. uterus. that's right. So cervix just means neck. All right. And then through the cervix, you've got the vagina. Do you have the etymology of vagina? Yeah, so the vagina kind of comes from, again, Latin, which um, means sheath or scabbard. I never really yeah. used that term. No. Scabbard. Scabbard, no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. But a sheath. Sheath So obviously or this covering. is where you take your sword... And put it into the sheath. Yeah. Or so, oh, okay. um, if you think about it like that, it's a pretty horrible, or, <laughs> horrible descriptor to use to term the vagina that. I don't think it's for, for that particular. So not I'm to sure do that's with where it, I think it's more to the covering of the sheath of like grain, like say wheat or pods. So but not a sword. I don't think so. Oh, good. But I could be wrong. Okay. okay. But I think it derives more from a agricultural. Derivative meaning the seed pod opening. Yes. It covers that opening. Okay, cool. But again, I could be wrong there. And then vulva. Vulva means to twist or to turn, but also possibly for a wrapper or a wrapping to enclose objects. So that would make sense because the vulva anatomically is kind of a structure that encloses the external kind of... Anatomy. Yeah, yeah. So the vulva. If it's, so now we're at the external anatomy. Yeah. You've got the vulva, which is going to include the mons pubis. So if you've got your fill your pubic bone, there's going to be a fatty pad that sits there. That's part of the vulva. But then you're also going to have the labia. So what's the etymology of labia? That would be lips. Lips. And so these are just uh, bits of tissue, skin. That's yep. present, and you've got the outer labia, which is labia majora. majora and that would be the equivalent to the scrotum. Okay, and then you've got the more internal aspect, which menorah. is the labia minora. Yeah. And then if you were to have a look at the labia minora, the junction of the labia minora, probably most superficially or you'd probably say anteriorly, um, you'll have the clitoris. So yes. do you have the etymology of clitoris? Clitoris, let me pull that up. I think that comes from a, there's a number of kind of thoughts here it it also comes from the possibility of small mountain so that okay. could be the top end of the menorah yeah okay but it's also could have a derivative from a latch or a key oh. okay but there's a, there's a few that it's thought that it derives from also slightly to, to sheath but that would probably be, be the prepuce which is the sheet of the clitoris which would be equivalent to the foreskin in the male so right. the glands penis would be the equivalent to the clitoris. Okay. So it's, so it's a, a high sense organ. Yeah. But also um, contractile, I guess you'd say. Yeah. So, yeah. As in yeah. like it can get engorged with blood to increase size. Similar to the glands penis. That's right. So it's a tissue that's essential for arousal, pleasure, um, huge amounts of nerve endings that's present. Right. And has the capacity to be engorged with blood. Yes. So you've got the clitoris. Erectile, that's what I was trying to come at. Erectile, erectile tissue. tissue. Uh, and so we spoke about the, the labia, both labia majora, labia minora, probably playing so a the role. So the minora would be equivalent properties. to the, the raffae for the male. Oh, okay. So the, the bottom zip line yep. along the penis down into the scrotum. Yep, yep, yep. That would be the minora. So in the male it closes. Right. In some cases I think it's high as 1% of male births. Yeah to maybe half a percent. Doesn't close. Doesn't close. And so that's termed a degree of hypospadias. Right. Just meaning it's got a slight opening. Yep, yep. What have we missed? I think that's the main structures in terms. Yep. But I think what we can do now is quickly just go through the the actual anatomy quickly. Okay? What do you mean? Well, we've, we've introduced the terms, but I think we'll just a little bit more detail with going through each one of these internal, uh, individual oh, and structures. associated functions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Where do you want to begin? So let's leave the ovary for now because right. we're going to encounter this significantly when we do the menstrual cycle. Very true. Okay. So let's go to the uterine tubes. Yep. 
as I said, this has a number of names, fallopian tubes, oviducts, salpinks. These are J-shaped structures and they've kind of, like you said, they look like an arm. Mm -hmm. So you've got the frimbrae, which are in a close approximation to the ovary. Yep. And they play an important role in sweeping the egg into the ampulla. Okay. So the ampulla is the largest portion of the fallopian tubes. And if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, we're going to have an image of the internal anatomy of the yeah. female reproductive system so you can review that. The, the Probably the widened area where it first comes in to the so uterus. The, so the, you get the frimbrae when you get the widened funnel area, that's in fundibulin, and then the ampulla, which is just approximate to that, and that would be the, the location, the most common locations for fertilisation to take place. So you're saying once the ovum is ovulated from the ovary, taken by the fimbrae into the uterine tubes, pretty much at the neck where the fimbrae sort of turn mostly into the uterine tubes, that's the infundibulum. Yeah. And that's where most of the, f- the fertilisation will come. Just a long bit further, the ampulla. The ampulla. Okay. So you're saying that the sperm yeah. effectively has to go from the vagina, yeah. through the cervix, yeah. through the uterus, yeah. through the uterine tubes. Correct. And so the, most the, of the way. The uterine tube connecting to the uterus is the isthmus, which is just it means narrowing. Yeah. So the, the sperm have to go all the way along those right. where it then would hope to encounter the egg. Okay. Now, the fun- so the function of the fallopian tubes yep. would be to transfer the oocyte but also to allow certain processes for the sperm that's, that's coming the opposite way. Right. Now, once the egg has been fertilised, it has to spend probably five to seven days to, In go, transit. to go the opposite way. Okay. Now, this is where the function of the fallopian tubes would enhance that movement. So I believe that the transmission of the sperm by the fallopian tubes is more enhanced by muscular activity. Yep. So kind of type of peristalsis, not quite. As opposed to the motility of the sperm themselves? Yeah, not a great deal, I don't think, at that point. And so part of the... Probably exhausted by then because they've had to go through mucus through the, cer- through the cervix. Yep. Significant pH difference. Through In the vagina. Through, through the vagina. So vagina first, then cervix. Then it has to navigate its way through this uterus. Yep. Um, which now, will be a bit flattened off. Which so. is what I was just about to say. So, so it's not like it's this big open yeah. you know, cavity. It is basically going to be a, a, a narrowed pathway. Um, which it would need to go through and then... Yeah, and so you the sperm are probably following a chemical gradient here yeah. that the egg or yeah, the ovum has been releasing. Mm. So, But many of the sperm, so you, know, you could look at 300 million sperm being deposited in the vagina. There's only going to be 1% of those that will possibly get to the egg level. Yeah. So many won't <laughs> get there. Yeah. So that many aren't very successful. Yeah, very true. But... The sperm have to go through a process called capacitation, which means they have to remove certain proteins from the head of the sperm to be able to penetrate through the follicular cells and then into the um, egg itself. And the zona pellucida. Yeah, that's right. And so the mucus, I think, produced in the fallopian tube does that capacitation. Right. So I think it is something between 12, 12 to 24 hours of capacitation has to take place. So what you're saying is from intercourse, ejaculation, the sperm need to undergo capacitation. So it's not like ejaculation occurs and then fertilisation occurs within the, you know. No, the like sperm can get there. The fastest sperm can get there in 30, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So it gets but there within 30 minutes. It still has to wash its head. Right, and that's the capacitation. Right. Is that where the fluid and, and substances within the, fallopian, the tube. fallopian tubes sort of allow for that to happen? Yeah. Then the head of the sperm can actually move through the cells that are surrounding the so egg that's, itself. That's right. So and the then break into the egg, release its genetic material. Correct. And then uh, basically the rest of the genetic meiosis for the processes for the occur. for the ovum has to go through it finished my meiosis too. Yeah. And then we'll you, get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get there. Otherwise, we're going to confuse everyone. Okay, we're just at the ut- uh, at the fl- at the uterine tubes. So now uterus. Yeah. So are you happy with the fallopian tube? Yeah. And the yeah. only other thing is they do have cilia as well, and the cilia I think pushes the egg the other way. 
So I think the peristalsis pushes the sperm one way, yep. and I think the cilia push the egg the other way. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's a wonder that we ever reproduce. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. So, so once the uh, egg's been fertilised, and ladies and gentlemen, please note that we will get through the process of how an oocytal egg develops and we'll go through the menstrual yeah. cycle and the 28 odd days of that and then ovulation and so forth. But we're just sort of using a fertilized egg as an example to, function. to identify the function of these structures. So uh, once that egg's been fertilized, it will implant in the uterus. Yes, that's right. But just while we're in the fallopian tubes, just as a clinical point here, uh, there are occasions where the fertilized eggs will implant into the fallopian tube. Yeah. And this would be a term... Uterine tube, man. Yeah. This would be termed an ectopic pregnancy. Yes. And this would be a medical emergency yep. because there's no way that the um, uterine tube can sustain a pregnancy. Well, that's right. Yes. And Even so, though it can obviously still secrete the various hormones, it obviously yeah, yeah. isn't sufficient to be able to uh, it'll, it'll maintain ru- pregnancy. It'll rupture and then lead to hemorrhage and, yeah, and probably death. Yeah. So there are many different extra uterine uh, implantation sites. Yeah. That would be the most common. It can also happen in the ovary. It can also happen in the abdominal cavity. I how's, saw one. How does it get through the? How does it get through the reproductive structures? Oh, it, it obviously the fimbrae didn't carry yeah. it appropriately, but it would have had to have been fertilized out there. Yeah, the sperm can go out. Right, so the sperm gets out That's through right. the uterine tube, yes. through the fallopian, and actually fertilizes. Can fertilize it, it in the ovary if it's not. Really? Uh, I've ovulated, yeah. Wow, okay. So that's another site of wow. ectopic. It can, I saw one on Twitter where uh, I think a gastroenterologist posted one that implanted in the liver. Whoa. So I don't know, maybe it was t- wow. 10, 12 weeks old. Really? In the liver. Wow, okay. And I came across at least one example where a full term was implanted in the the back of the uterus in the the pouch. They call it the pouch of Douglas, but it's the um, uh, uterine the, pouch. Yeah, but between the uterus and the rectum. Yeah. So it grew kind of in the back end of the uterus and went to full term. Okay. Well, for those watching, we'll put a uterine pouch up on t- on, on the screen so you can see. Um, wow. So I, I I just find that I don't know full term. Yeah. But how did the bub get through the birthing canal? If it's on oh, the it would have been a C section. Opposing side. Okay, so it wasn't a, 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 a vaginal delivery. No. Okay. All right, so we've got the uterus. So we now, we go, the u- the now we go to the uterus. Okay, so yeah. the uterus has a, a mul- so, multiple layers to this uterus. So, so the uterus is a secondary sex organ because what's the only primary one? Um, the ovary. Ovary. Okay, yeah. great. So the uterus, I guess you would say, is a muscle bag. Which, right. again, they Which, call you that. Uh, that's my nickname, yeah. So I feel for it. <laughs> so its function, I mean, it allows sperm to swim through it, um, but its primary function is to um, take upon the fertilised egg for nine months. Yeah. yeah. To allow it to grow and then to Gestation. expand and then eventually to leave, to exit. Yeah. So, so it's the site of nourishing yeah. basically... Uh, Two, when two become one, when two become one, when the sperm fertilizes. That's, that's in the uterine tube. I know, just wait. But when those two come together and the genetic material becomes mixed and then the cells begin to divide and it's already divided, what, 16-odd times, 32 maybe times, by the time it reaches the uterus, yeah. the cells are already now 32 cells-ish, it's implanted now in the wall of the uterus. Yeah. The uterus now itself will start to produce. Well, the uterus will by this point be already producing. highly vascularized, yeah. producing hormones. Uh, the basically the the fertilized egg is going to sort of create two divisions. One is going to yeah. be uh, that that's going to be out of cell the, mass, in a cell mass. Yeah, the placenta and then the bub. Yeah, and then hormones will be released from that that continue to tell the uh, uterine wall to thrive and thicken and become vascularized and so forth. Yeah. I mean, this happens throughout the menstrual cycle, which itself, we'll talk about. Which we'll talk about. Yeah. So, so the main, the so main, it's a very dynamic structure. Is the point we're trying to get at that when there's no implantation, 
it does not have the capacity to really hold anything. But once an egg has been implanted and after nine months, obviously the uterus can become quite large yeah. because you need an entire infant or soon to be newborn yeah. um, developing there. Correct. So it has the capacity to grow, expand, thicken, become more vascular and so forth. That's right. Yeah. So highly the, dynamic. So, <laughs> yes, okay. Yep. So the main structures you should know are the uterus. There's the fundus, which is the top part, and that's yep. the thing that you may measure clinically as the mother is progressing in pregnancy. Yep. That's the height of the fundus. It's the roof. The roof. So that would allow measurement on how far gestation has come along. Yep. We've got the body, which is the main part. This is the location where the implantation hopes to take place. Okay. So what if the implantation occurred at the fundus? Well, I guess it could. Yeah. It may just make things more challenging. Yeah. But I think it would be more problematic if it goes into the cervix region. Yeah. And so if you have a very low line placenta, because mm. then in theory you've got the placenta, which is growing and is, has a, is a huge vascular organ, Yeah. is taking up the opening or the exit point, whichever you want to look at it, yeah. of the uterus. Yeah. And so risk of bleeding or significant bleeding, but also the difficulty of the getting the baby out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so you've got the fundus, which is the roof, you've got the body, which is the main structure, and then you've got the cervix. And the cervix has other parts to it we can talk about in a second. Yep. But they're the main regions of the uterus. But when you look at the wall of the uterus, mm-hmm. you'll have the outer part, which is the peritoneum, Okay, so that would be kind of the equivalent to the the lining of a lot of the gastrointestinal. So basically, if you're saying that, so that the, would be the perimetrium. So if the uterus was a was a balloon, the out the outside of the balloon is the peritoneum. Yes. Okay, so that's continuous with the digestive system. That's right. But the, okay, sorry, go and on. And then the middle part, yeah, is the muscle, so the myometrium. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then we go to the endometrium. So this is if you were able to put your hand inside of that balloon, the inside is the endometrium. Yeah. And this structure can become highly vascularized. Yes. Right. So there's two parts to this. Yep. There's the basal layer and then there's a functional layer. So the basal layer is going to be the one in most contact with the myometrium, the muscle yes. layer that can contract to help push bub out after nine or so months. And what was the other layer? The most internal? Fun- functional. The functional. Or functionalis. And this is the one that becomes vascularized. Correct. This one cool. is the what the the part that grows and sheds every month. Yes. Which we'll talk about. Yeah. And so that one becomes interesting. Well, I mean, that's the one that's going to play the biggest role with monthly cycles. Yep. And that's the one that requires the hormones to dictate what it does. Um, but that also can inca- can cause quite significant problems in females and that mm-hmm. would be endometriosis as an example. Right. And so as we've just said, the endometrium should be located within the uterus, but in some uh, women it can be located outside that or just the way that it um, is impacted every month can be more challenging. Mm. And so as an example, my, my wife had um, moderate levels of endometriosis and that prevented us presumably falling pregnant and with it, she didn't she didn't really know that she had it right she would have relatively you know severe cramp in some months but men, i guess many women think that's just what pregnant uh, what menstrual yeah. cycling is right without knowing there's a problem there mm. and so because we had quite a, a, a challenge get falling pregnant and we went through all the typical stages of seeking fertility um, expertise. It wasn't until we went to another specialist who said, you know, we probably should um, investigate endometriosis and they usually do this diagnosis and treat it at the same time. So they do like a lapar- laparoscopy, yep. which is just keyhole look around. Yep. And there was quite a lot of endometrial tissue in other regions of her. Outside of the uterus. That's right. Peritoneal region. Yep. Okay. And so the doctor, the specialist. So it's quite an invasive tissue. Yeah. Yeah. Removed it. I remember Dr. Carl talking once and he said there was a case of a, a female who had it in her nose. Oh, yeah, and basically through every month. Should have, have nosebleeds. Yeah. yeah. So it's obviously tissue that can seed 
Yeah. And because of its dynamic capacity, its ability to significantly grow, develop and become vascularized, that you probably don't need a lot of tissue for it to seed certain areas to get the hormonal stimuli every month to signify or tell it to start to grow and divide and That's become right. thicker. That's right? right. And so then hence depending on where it is, mm. again, another example of my, my sister's close friend, she had it all along her gastrointestinal tract. Wow. And so she had significant cramping, you know, gut Inside issues. Inside of the gastrointestinal tract? No, I think on the outside, but right. it grew kind of into it. Right. And so, again, every month excruciating wow. gastrointestinal issues. That'd and so she, recently she just had to have a whole lot of bowel resected because of the impact that it had on her. Wow. So this condition is so widespread mm. and it is now becoming more recognised which it should be. Yeah, of course. And of so course. for us, just by and, – and at this stage, we had already been through a number of IVF cycles and so forth. But just by the removal of this endometrial tissue, the next cycle we felt pregnant naturally. Wow. Yeah. So wow. showing the impact that this can have on fertility Yeah. because of – by having all this endometrial tissue external to the uterus, it can have quite a impact on – egg quality and just the ability for the egg to be fertilised yeah. and to sustain well, the implantation. I mean, if you think about the – I mean, we haven't even gone through the menstrual cycle yet and there's already a lot of uh, structures and complexity uh, in regards to having an egg ovulate and then having the sperm make it to the egg and then having it fertilised and then having it implant at a, the appropriate time, having the hormonal levels – at the right level, yeah, yeah. you know, like all these things need to sort of fit in at the right time and there's the the, the range and leeway is obviously uh, quite narrow. Yes. Right? Yes. And this is the thing. It, 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 you know, it's, it can be a very difficult process for people. So, you know, again, my heart goes out to so many people um, who have difficulties. It, it, I, I can't even comprehend and again, with same with endometriosis. Yeah, you know, the, we don't, we're not. Hope everybody realizes that. Uh, obviously, again, having two males talking about the female reproductive system, we can talk about what we know regarding the textbook, what we know about anatomy and physiology, but we can't give you experiential knowledge. That's right. So you know, uh, and we do acknowledge that. So we apologise if we can't give you that insight. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's, the, that's in the uterus. That's the main structures. Stru uh, cervix through and then vaginal opening and then, okay, cool. So, so just a couple of final points with the uterus. Yeah. It's just usually the position of it is something called anti-vex, uh, anti-verted, which just means the fundus is kind of superior, to, the superior to but also posterior to the bladder but it's kind of flopped over anteriorly. So the uterus is sort of resting on the yeah, bladder. Yeah, there you go. So that would be called antiverted. Yep. But if it was kind of anti-flexed, it would be flexed the opposite way towards the rectum, I guess. That would be another position that gotcha. the uterus can be in. So it, it's basically sitting between the bladder and the rectum yeah. and depending on how it's feeling, it's either going to flop onto the bladder or fall back onto the rectum. Kind of. It, ligaments would probably have yes. a role here. But yeah, yes. I'm just sort of... Yeah. But also the, just the morphology of the anatomy. Yeah. And then some uteruses can have kind of two parts to it. Mm. Instead of just one fundus, it could kind of have a, a bifornix, I think it's called, yeah. just kind of two ends to it, yeah. which, again, could make pregnancy more challenging. We need to state that, and, you know, for us, it, we sort of don't even consider it um, because we think it's common knowledge, but it's, it's actually not common knowledge. Uh, there are two openings associated with the vestibule. I mean, there is the urethra and the vaginal opening. There are yeah. many people out there that think there's a single opening that, um, like the penis, for example. Oh, two, right? two things come out of it? Yes. Mm. You know, you've got sperm being ejaculated and you've got urine coming out of the same opening. But that is not the case when it comes to the female reproductive system. You have the urethra, which is sitting more anterior, and then more posterior is the vaginal opening. Two separate openings. And this is obviously a very important distinction 
that needs to be made. Another probably important point that probably should be highlighted is when it comes to urinary tract infections, um, and infections generally in this area, uh, even though this isn't the urinary system, it's important to state that obviously f- females are probably more prone to getting urinary tract infections. Much higher. Simply because of the location of the urethra and also the fact that it, it has a, a much more narrow opening when it comes, yeah. as in... Or shorter, shorter short urethra. Opening, urethra. Yeah. Yeah, and, and because there is a close proximity between the vagina and the external urethral orifice... Yeah. Um, one of the greatest risk factors for a UTI is post-coitus yeah. or intercourse yeah. just because of the change in uh, flora and microbiology. Yes, yeah. yeah, exactly right, exactly right. The last thing just, sorry, the, to the end of the uterus is just the cervix that I just wanted to talk about yep. really quickly and that is obviously important for, again, the passageway of sperm going up. Mm-hmm. So it outside, now you might say about day 11 to day 15, the, the cervix of, what? of the menstrual cycle. Okay. The mucus that the cervix produces thins out and allows the, the sperm to travel through it much easily. Yep. But outside those time periods, the cervix produces a thicker mucus and it would be near impossible for the sperm to get through it. Yeah. So it's so sort that, of gatekeeping yeah. to allow for uh, timing to be appropriate. And it plays an important role with sterility as well. So, particularly, I guess, in pregnancy. And again, another issue that my wife had in both pregnancies was the cervix size. Oh, yeah. And we had to be monitored because we've had a number of miscarriages. Mm. Uh, we had to be monitored for the length of the cervix okay. in the pregnancy because that's it shortens and I think once it gets below 20 millimetres, it's start of a risk that the um, amnion can rupture. So when you say shortening... You mean that? The length of the cervix. The length of the cervix because you've got the uh, uterus above it, yep. the vagina below it, and you're saying the length of the cervix between those two structures, if that shortens, yes, it can increases the likelihood of? A preterm pregnancy. Gotcha. And so for both of the successful pregnancies that we've had, um, my wife had to take uh, intravaginal progesterone. Right. And that is thought to keep the cervix longer. And we'll be talking about the role of yeah, progesterone progester- now? Almost. Okay. Sorry, I'm, That's I okay. like my anatomy. I, I can tell because it's already been nearly an hour and we're just on the anatomy, <laughs> Sorry. which is fine, Sorry. which is absolutely fine. But the last thing I'll say got- with the cervix is just as a um, clinical relevance is the type of cells here are prone to a certain infection. Okay. And it's a certain virus. Right. Which would be a wart virus, right? Herpes simplex. Is it simplex or pap- papilloma? Papilloma, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I think simplex is also, but yeah. I think HPV, yeah. human papilloma virus, runs the risk of changing the cell type, the cell type here, which yes. then pushes the risk into... Because for a virus to, to replicate, mm. it has to hijack your genetic system, right? Yeah. And in doing so, it can change the way that your cells reproduce. Mm. And in this case, it makes the cervical cells overactive. Yep. And then you go towards a risk of developing cervical cancer. And so the greatest risk factor for cervical cancer would be HPV and hence the development of the vaccine. A, a very successful vaccine. Saving millions of lives. And it's also important saving to, millions of lives. And it's also important to note here that because you'll hear this response that why are the boys getting this? As in, why are the boys getting vaccinated? Yeah, well, and and the importance to note here is that um, the virus can be transmitted by males. Yeah, and so that's a reason for taking it, but also the risk that um, the virus can also cause cancer in other regions. So it can cause, I think, esophageal. Or pharynx, pharyngeal cancers are higher now. Yeah. So similarly from a virus. Yeah. So it's not just the cervix that are impacted by this virus. No, that's right. It can be in other regions. So the importance of needing to vaccinate both. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, a large study showed that vaccinated females showed a nearly 90% reduction in cervical cancer. So this, but the problem is fewer people are getting vaccinated. Yeah, especially just, at the back end of the pandemic, right? So there's a lot of misinformation yeah. now that people just... But also, prior to COVID, 
when the prevalence of diseases reduced, people didn't see it as much as a, of a threat. So less people are likely to go and get vaccinated because they're like, no one gets that. Yeah, but they didn't realise how many people did, how many people were at risk. So, yes, HPV vaccine, get it. <laughs> uh, do you want to know anything else? Well, Ex- it depends what you, you have to say. <laughs> external anatomy? Sure. Or do you want to do the vagina? Yeah. It's just a, uh, the vagina is a, a muscular tube Yep. Um, that, again, plays a role in sexual intercourse. Mm-hmm. Um, childbirth is the, that would be, I guess you'd term the birth canal, Yep. but it would be the last point of menstruation. So menstruation would have to pass through the vagina to it exit in the body. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think there's much more unless you've got something. No, nope. I think and we then I th- should move into and the And then I think all the etymology, etymology terms that we gave, we've spoke about the clitoris, we spoke about the the two labia, yep. the mons pubis. I mean, the mons pubis is just a – mons means mountain, yep. mountain on pu- on the pubicle or the pubic tubicle. Yep. Um, that has got a significant amount of fat mm-hmm. and that is to, I believe, to reduce pain in intercourse. What is? The mons pubis. Is to reduce pain. Yeah, so – Oh, they said produce. No, reduce. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also uh, uh, Bartholin's glands – which are called the uh, greater, greater vestibular glands. And so you've got so, greater and lesser, right? Yes. And so you've got the these t- two basically pea-shaped sized glands either side of the vaginal opening within that vestibule. Remember the vestibule is basically the area that encompasses the urethral opening, the vaginal opening and the tissue between, basically everything within the labia minora. Yeah. Um, and it plays an important role in secreting mucus, aiding in vaginal lubrication, and so forth. Yeah. But I think outside of those structures, we probably should start focusing <laughs> on the menstrual cycle. Okay, I agree. Don't you think? I agree. Because there's hormones to go through. I've, speak, I've spoken too long, I know. No, no, it's okay. It's, um, you know, you probably should shut up, but menstrual cycle. Let's talk about that. So basically what we're saying is, okay, let's first begin <laughs> pre-puberty. Pre-puberty. Okay. So. How, how what age are you? Okay, well, we could talk about... At birth? Prior to birth. Okay. We could talk in utero. So what some people probably might know is that for males, you don't produce sperm until you hit puberty, you know, so probably 11, 12 years of age. It's becoming younger and younger. I read something that... Is that true? Yeah, something crazy like a number of months per year. For the last decade. It's reducing. It's reducing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Didn't know that. I'm not uh, sure if that's just for the female. Maybe it's more just for the female. Okay. But it is a lot earlier than it has been previously. So prior to puberty, for males, no sperm's produced. Puberty hits, hormones change, particularly hormones called gonadotropins. Uh, there's two major types, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. These hormones are important in both the male and female reproductive systems but they're named after what they do in the female reproductive system. But, oh, right. But so, the, so the luteal is a hormone that um, makes things go white? Yellow. Yellow. Makes things go yellow. Okay. Yep. Um, and follicles. It's the, the follicle. Yeah, males yep. don't have the, the follicles that females yeah, have. Yeah. Um, but regardless, those hormones need to be released for sperm to be produced. doesn't happen until puberty. For females, the sperm equivalent, which is the egg, the oocyte, all those oocytes have been produced. Oh, like you've made all the amount that you'll ever make. By the time you're four or five months in utero. Probably even earlier. Right? Yeah. And so you're, you're probably going to have around about a million or more. What primordial. We call, well, I th- yeah, primordial oocytes or, pri- or, or, or primary prim- oocytes. Primary oocytes or primordial. Follicles. Follicles. Yeah. So the primary oocyte, which is just basically going from a stem cell yeah. egg to an actual egg but very immature egg, yeah. you'll probably have over a million of those so by this the is, time you're four to five months in utero. Okay, so this is paused in the first phase of meiosis. Okay, so let's just talk about, let's <laughs> just talk about this. that. This is important though, right? <laughs> so if you think about it, we said earlier, this is why I brought it up earlier. Every is, this, cell- is this Mendel here we're talking about? Yeah, bit of Mendel, bit of the... Uh, what nationality was Mendel? 
Austrian? Austrian, Austrian monk? Yeah, Austrian anyway, monk. Gregor Mendel, Austrian monk, uh, identified inheritance patterns, or at least the Mendelian in inheritance flowers. patterns in pea plants. Peas. Yes, yes. Pea flowers. Okay. Um, uh, basically very few things inherit through a Mendelian fashion now. But anyway. Wow. Um, so if I were to take a skin cell from you, it has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chromosome 1 to 23. But they're pairs. So you've got two chromosome 1, two chromosome 2, two chromosome 3 and so forth. So let's just look at chromosome 1. Because you've got two of them, your dad gave you one, your mum gave you the other one. All right. So if you want to take your cells and make a, uh, an offspring of Matt, mm. you get a female and you can't just take her skin cell because that's going to have 23 pairs of chromosomes as well. The offspring needs to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. But if you take your 23 pairs and your partner's 23 pairs and put them together, you have 46 pairs. Right. Your offspring doesn't want 46 pairs. Mm. It wants half of that. Yeah. So what do we do? Cut, so in, cut in half. You cut them in half. So your sex cells, and let's just focus on you as a male with sperm, each of your sperm will have half of your 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay. Which makes sense because your individual 23 chromosomes need to combine with your wife's individual 23 chromosomes and that's how your child gets one from mum, one from dad of yep. each one, right? Yep. Okay. And that's what happens in males. It starts off with your 23 pairs. It doubles that genetic material. It then pulls it apart. So now instead of having one cell with 23 pairs of chromosomes, you've got two cells with 23 pairs of chromosomes. They've recombined because you don't want an identical copy yeah, of you, yeah. right? So they've recombined and then they've been pulled apart again. And now what you have is basically from one individual cell, you've got four cells, four sperm cells. That are different. That are, that, are diff that are all different from each other, but all contain only one copy of chromosome yeah. one. So they've been shuffled a bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. All right. So, so it's it, like throwing your wash, washing in the washing machine, doing two cycles, coming out with four different things. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> but it's different in, in females, right? So I always get, I always, no, you keep going. Okay. So what I just said for males, all of that happens in the testes when puberty hits. But for females, you can be in utero for four months in utero and you will have taken your oogonia, your, your basically uh, stem cell of an egg, right? It's going to have 23 pairs of chromosomes like all the other cells. It doubles that, right? And then it just pauses. So what? Uh, it's, it pauses in phase one. Well, it pauses right there. Yeah, phase right. one myosis. Yes. Yep. And what that means is by the time a female has hit puberty, her eggs have double the amount of DNA, okay. right? They've, yep. they've uh, doubled the 23 pairs of chromosomes and then puberty hits. Now puberty hits, the process of the menstrual cycle occurs where nearly every day of their reproductive life from, what, 11, 12, 12 to 40, late 40s? Yep. Ish, um, ten to thirty. Is this called menarche or something? Menarche, yeah. Menarche. Um, ten to thirty of these oocytes every begin, day. Every day begin the process of maturation and development, right? But remember, they're stuck with having double the amount of yeah. DNA, twenty-three pairs. So puberty hits. We select the body selects ten to thirty of these eggs. Now, by the time you hit puberty. You've gone from having a bit over a million of these primary oocytes to having probably half a million oocytes. Right? Well, lost a few. You've lost probably half of them th okay. just throughout that process. And this is just, you know, the natural process of development and, and, and growth, right? Now, the question that gets asked sometimes is, well, if you've got half a million eggs but only 10 to 30 every day sort of get chosen to take the process of developing further... How, which, how do they get chosen? And it seems to be what's called the production line hypothesis is that early on in the gonads, in the ovaries, in gonadal development in utero, 
the first oocytes that were produced tend to be the first that mature okay. at puberty. So like conveyor belt. Yeah. Like so at the, the first, at, at first the, products at produced. the supermarket, what you put at the front out of your trolley. Yeah. The ones at the front are the ones that will become. The ones that came off the conveyor belt at the factory first are the ones that you want to yeah. sell first. All right. Okay. Right. To, to use a very gross an, a, anatomy. Yeah. That anatomy. Yeah. Analogy. Right. So puberty hits, you've got 23, uh, double the amount of DNA of 23 pairs of chromosomes, double that. Puberty hits, 10 to 30 get chosen. They recombine their DNA, right, and then they get pulled apart. Now they get pulled apart to produce one egg that contains 23 pairs of chromosomes and the other one is called a polar body that gets discarded. Mm. Now this one that has 23 pairs of chromosomes, this is the one that gets ovulated, Right. But the, there's still a problem here. Has to finish another round. You have to. It doesn't want 23 pairs. It wants half of that because it needs to recombine with the sperm, right? That only has half of that, right? Yeah. So, again, what needs to happen is that this needs this one. In actual fact, doesn't get pulled apart before the sperm comes. The sperm comes in, puts its head in, gives it the genetic material, tells it to hurry up, and then it stimulates it to undergo the second, finalise the second meiosis, meiosis phase. Before the fertilisation can Before technically. fertilisation occurs. And so or the pulls, swapping of the genetic material, yeah. Yeah, so it pulls apart again. Now it's an egg that only has one chromosome one, one chromosome two, one chromosome three from mum. The sperm's already in there containing one chromosome one from dad, one chromosome two and so forth. The other one that split off is another polar body yeah. that gets discarded. So basically you, you continually discard these polar bodies, which is sort of like byproducts of the egg undergoing the, each process of, of meiosis. So take-home message is uh, by the time a female is born, they've got all the eggs they require for ovulation and they're frozen at basically meiosis one where they've doubled the amount of DNA present. It needs to combine its genetic material with each other and split apart now it's just got 23 pairs of chromosomes. That will ovulate, come into contact with the sperm, delivering its single chromosomes. Which it developed which, in utero. Which it developed, no, which it developed at puberty. But I mean like it had already um, completed its two stages of meiosis by birth, right? No. No, no, it, it only happens once oh, is it? A, a, a male hits puberty. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this whole process of what's called oogenesis basically the genetic material doubling, swapping or recombining and being pulled apart, that all happens for males once puberty hits. Okay. Yeah. And for females, it happened in utero, the first half of it, and then the last half after ovulation. Does that make okay, sense? It does. I know it's complex, but I do have a YouTube video that goes through it. So if you would like to, uh, to, to watch that YouTube video, I will provide the, the link for you. And... Uh, yeah, very nice it, of you, Michael. I think it's I think it's pretty easy to un understand. So um, while while they're watching this, they can have a break. We ha we can take a break here. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's take a break for an ad, and we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we've gone through a couple of important points. Um, we haven't really started the menstrual cycle yet, but we have spoken about how oocytes or the eggs are different to the to the sperm. Um, we need to talk about the very beginning of the menstrual cycle, right? The menstrual cycle is a cycle that sort of prepares the uterus for egg implantation, fertilised egg implantation, which means it also prepares ovum, or which are mature oocytes or eggs, to be ovulated. And a whole range of hormones are being released in various quantities at, at various times. So it is a, a relatively complex cycle, so with this cycle, you could break it into two parts, right? You could look at what's happening at the ovary. Yeah. And you could look at what's happening at the uterus. Yeah. And you can look at the hormone levels. Yeah. But I mean, if you were to open your textbook, yeah, it sometimes looks at the phases of the menstrual cycle in the context of the ovary, which would be the follicular yeah. versus luteal stage, which we'll talk about. But then there's also the phases, the two phases at the uterus, which is the proliferative and the secretory. Yes, that's right. So, And then the hormones obviously play a role with how these phases are different. Yeah. So the very first thing we should say is that 
once puberty hits, um, the hypothalamus, which is the bas- master regulator. Yeah, the regular, master regulator. Like regular, no, I'm not even going to try. Okay, I'll say it. The master regulator there of the go. endocrine <laughs> system. It gets stimulated to re- release a stimulatory hormone, which travels to this gland that sits underneath the hypothalamus called the pituitary gland. So is this always happening even up to puberty? Like is there a small amounts of this hormone being released in the hypothalamus? Not until puberty. Oh, really? Yeah. So once puberty hits... I just thought it became more pulsatile once puberty oh, hits. Oh, look, I'm sure that the... the I'm sure it's going to be... Rela- I'm, I wouldn't say it's absent, but once you hit puberty, the pulsatile release from the hypothalamus to stimulate the anterior pituitary gland... Becomes more apparent. ...to release the gonadotropins, which are luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. The, the pulse happens every 90 minutes and lasts for about 5 to 20 minutes. So basically... Did you time this? Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's why you had this stopwatch earlier today. <laughs> so um, I'm just measuring how much follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone I'm releasing, Matt. Uh, so, yeah, every 90 minutes you have this pulse. Is that b- both for male and female? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have this pulse every 90 minutes for around about 5 to 20 minutes s- releasing these pulses of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone once puberty hits. What does it do? So... First thing we need to talk about, I think, is, like you said, if we break the um, menstrual cycle up, it's approximately 28 days. So so really it, it can go from 20 to 35 days. 37. But, but let's go 28 as a, a standard typical menstrual period. So if, okay, so you can, so if we say 28 days, right, as, as average, and obviously everything's about a range. It can be plus or minus. Well, basically it can be minus, it could be as low as 21 days and probably be considered not an issue and as high as probably 37 days and possibly not be considered an issue. If it's lower than 21 days, it means you're having too, too many cycles, mm-hmm. right? And so that's called polymenorrhea. So menorrhea is the process. Many of, periods. Yep. Uh, and if it's greater than 37 days, it means you're having too few menstrual cycles and this is called oligomenorrhea. And so, again, too few periods. Uh, but if we take this 28 days just as the average, obviously everything we're talking about is the average, you know, we, for simplicity's sake. Um, there's four hormones involved in this process. There's estrogen and the primary estrogen hormone that we're going to talk about is estradiol. So estrogen is an umbrella term that encompasses three a number of hormones that are similar to each other. Yeah, mainly there's mainly three different estrogen derivatives, yeah. but estradiol is the primary one, particularly in this process. And the most powerful one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and progesterone is the second hormone we're going to talk about. The third is follicle-stimulating hormone, and the fourth is luteinizing hormone. And not in that order, but these are the four hormones of the female reproductive cycle, and these four hormones help um, prepare the egg ovulate the egg, prepare the uterus and allow for implantation to occur. Yep. Right? All right. So like you alluded to, if we take the 28 days and break it in half, draw a line straight down the middle at day 14, the first half you could call the follicular phase and the last half you call the you could look, call the luteal phase. Now that gives you an indication, at least of two of those hormones, what hormones are primarily going to be used in each of those phases? Mm-hmm. Follicle stimulating hormones, the primary hormone for the first 14 days, and luteinizing hormone for the last 14 days. Yep. Right? Um, the follicular phase is referring to these cells that surround the oocyte or the egg. So by the time you hit puberty, your half a million odd oocytes or eggs will be surrounded by these cells called granulosa cells usually around about one layer of granulosa cells. The oocyte with the granulosa cells together are called follicles. And at this stage, they're called primordial follicles. Is it also, just to, to be completely accurate, there's an outer covering as well, which is the theca cells? Yeah, but they haven't really developed yet. Okay, all right. Yeah. So these, these are the primordial follicles. These are the ones that get selected every day. 10 to 30 of them to undergo the process of maturation and development. Okay. So what you could say is that day one of this menstrual cycle, just for completion's sake, and we'll get back, we'll be finishing where we begin, at day one is basically when 
menstruation begins. So this is when the bleeding aspect of menstruation begins. This is day one of the menstrual cycle. Okay. So just so everyone is aware, day one, 10 to 30 eggs are getting selected, right? They're primordial follicles, which means they are an oocyte with a single layer of granulosa cells and the granulosa cells basically nourish the oocyte, basically keep it alive. They go from being primordial follicles to primary follicles to secondary follicles. And all that happens in this process is the follicles get bigger, which means the granulosa cells get bigger. The oocyte gets bigger. So the oocyte, if the egg's getting bigger, you need more nourishment so the granulosa cells get bigger. And like you said, another layer on the outside of the granulosa called the theca cells, they start to become more apparent and they get bigger. So while the granulosa cells are feeding or nourishing the egg, the theca cells, they start to produce hormones, Mm -hmm. estrogen and progesterone. Now, here's the thing. During this process, it's not really regulated by any hormone in particular. It just happens. Once you hit puberty and you've got those pulsatile releases of FSH and LH, that's sort of the broad stimulus for all of this to start, right? But what you'll find is that the FSH that's being released in these early phases through the pulsatile release, it stimulates the follicles to continue developing. Mm -hmm. So if I were to drop follicle-stimulating hormone onto these primordial oocytes that are now turning to primary and secondary, it basically says, hey, keep growing, get larger, bigger follicle cells, right? Of these 10 to 30, one's going to become most prominent or pronounced, It's going to become the the one that's the biggest, right? And the bigger it gets, the more of its stuff it produces from the granulosa and theca cells. So more nutrients, but also more estrogen and progesterone from the theca cells. Now, here's the thing. As this estrogen starts to increase, so now we're hitting, you know, we're a couple of days into this process, estrogen starting to rise because the development of these theca cells are producing more estrogen. Now, as you hit moderate levels of estrogen, the estrogen does two things, two major, well, does three things, really. First thing that the estrogen does is for the main follicle that's producing most of this estrogen, it's telling it, hey, make more FSH receptors, follicle-stimulating hormone receptors, which means of the FSH that's being released from the, hyper, from the pituitary gland, it's going to have most of its effect on this one developing follicle as opposed to the other, you know, 10 to 30. Right? Okay, yep. So this one's starting to become selected for. The estrogen also feeds back to the hypothalamus and says, hey, just reduce the amount of FSH you're releasing. So that... Okay, so the, the pituitary lit- gland. But does it also inhibit the gene uh, gonadotrophin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus? Yeah, so that's where it's having its inhibitory effect is at the hypothalamus. Oh, okay. So the hypothalamus is not releasing as much gonadotropin releasing hormone, which inhibits the release of the gonadotropins, which is follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Less FSH means those developing follicles are neglected, right? Because there's no follicle stimulating hormone saying grow, grow, grow. And so how many did you say started the cycle? 10 to 30. 10 to 30. Yeah. Okay. So 29 of them mm. are running out of their FSH. Yeah. So they're going to... Die off. Die off. Undergo atresia. Okay. Which basically means they start to degrade and get re- reabsorbed. Apoptosis. Yep. Apoptosis, get resorbed back into the ovary. Mm. Right? And then there's this one. Now, uh, the Dom- third thing... Dominant one. The third thing that the estrogen does is it tells the uterus to start preparing itself. The inner lining of the uterus called the endometrium. It says thicken up, become more vascularized. Yeah, and I think it's also going to be doing other things in the body as well. So it's going to the breast and this is going to be the start of development in the puberty. Yeah. So yeah. the stages of puberty is now for the female is going to go dictated by the, the size of the breast. Yep. And there's five stages to go through to kind of hit adulthood, but also that is going to impact. But I think testosterone has more an impact, which can be converted from this, right? Yes. Testosterone. Um, into well, if, if we look at the way, just very quickly, if you look at these hormones, so, you know, if you think of progesterone, testosterone and estrogen as the three major sex hormones, it basically goes, starts off as cholesterol, yeah. which then turns into progesterone, 
which then turns into testosterone, which then turns into estrogen. Yeah, okay. Right? So now obviously other things can be produced off the side of each of these byproducts, but that's the major course of production. So testosterone can turn into estrogen yeah, and that's okay. generally what happens. There is testosterone produced by the ovaries in this process, but most of it get t- gets turned into estrogen. Right. And it's important to say that all three of these hormones are anabolic. They're growth hormones. Yeah, they're okay. stimulatory. They tell the uterus to grow, thicken, and develop, but they also tell the breast tissue to develop. They also tell protein synthesis to occur. So it, they are very much anabolic. Right. Okay. So the estrogen that you're talking about, that's increasing now. We've hit puberty, so this is going to happen more frequently. Yep. And so just by the sum of the amount of estrogen that's now exposed to the body through the subsequent months, the estrogen is having a change in effect on the body. Yeah. So the breasts are getting bigger, yeah. but also the external female genitalia, which would be the secondary sex characteristics. Yeah. So that would be the clitoris, the labia, the, the end part of the vagina is starting to get larger. Yeah. But the testosterone, which you said can be made in this cholesterol process, Yes. the testosterone will be also made to a smaller degree in the adrenal gland for yep. the female, which would cause a change to pubic hair or the auxiliary hair yeah, production. and the distribution of that hair. And also maybe libido, sex drive. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's most of it. Yeah, I think I'll – oh, but actually, no. Yeah. The, <laughs> the bone density yeah. changes, but also estrogen during the period of menarche, yep. is that the correct term? Yeah. So from puberty onset to menopause, yep. estrogen actually has a quite of a important, anabolic effect, important role in the cardiovascular system. Yeah. Oh and yeah. And so yeah. with blood vessel uh, maintenance. Yeah. But particularly for that period, so what are we talking? Twelve to forty to forty, Late forty-five. 40s. So yeah. we're talking about thirty odd years, thirty-five years. The female typically would be protective or protected from cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Because of this estrogen and also bone density. Yeah, I said bone density. You did, okay, yeah. And so then... Uh, yeah, we'll get there yeah, we'll get once there. it's all finished. Um, okay, so th- at the moment we're maybe 10 days into this process, right, 10 days into the menstrual cycle. Um, what's happened is that of the 30, we've selected one. The selection happens because of the increasing estrogen that's been produced by the, those follicles uh, or that follicle, so the theca cells specifically, it's increasing the amount of FSH receptors, so it's become selected for by the FSH. The estrogen pr- helps prepare the uterus for implantation if that occurs, uh, and it tells the hypothalamus to tell the pituitary gland release less FSH, so those other ones don't get selected for. Those other ten to twenty nine odd uh, oocytes undergo atresia and break down. And now what happens is that you've got this single uh, follicle that now is starting to really grow quite large. Now, the larger it gets, the more estrogen it produces. And so probably 48 hours before day 14. So two, two days before? Yeah, two days before day 14, the estrogen levels are really high. And those really high estrogen levels no longer have a negative effect on the hypothalamus. For whatever reason, we don't know why it has a stimulatory effect on the hypothalamus, which tells the hypothalamus... It's a positive feedback. Positive feedback, and it says, hey, release heaps of FSH and LH, particularly LH for whatever reason. So now we're hitting pretty much day close to day 14 here. Luteinizing hormone goes through the roof. So what hormones have we spoken about so far? Slowly, estrogen is rising throughout the first 14 days till it peaks just before day 14. Follicle-stimulating hormone has gone up and then gone back down again, right, because of it's, it's been released yeah, yeah. from the pulsatile effect and then it goes back down because of the inhibitory estrogen effect, but then it goes back up again at day 14. So this is a surge. This is a surge and then at day 14, luteinizing hormone shoots to the roof. Yeah. So what both the FSH and luteinizing hormone do just before day 14 is a couple of things. Further stimulates those follicles, right? Because then you've got heaps more follicle stimulating hormone. It just lasts 48 hours, gets huge. The oocyte and the follicle gets to around about 1.5 centimetres in, in size, a, a point that I mentioned earlier. Huge. It stimulates the granulosa cells to produce more estrogen and it stimulates the theca cells as well to start producing estrogen and progesterone. Both of these go to the 
endometrium and say, okay, really prepare because if there's a fertilization occurring, we may have to implant. So this is the proliferative phase of the uterus at this point? Yes. In day zero to day 14? Yes. The other thing that luteinizing hormone does is it goes to the theca cells, particularly in the outer layer of the theca cells, tells them to become highly vascularized and also tells them to release proteolytic enzymes. These enzymes start to weaken the wall of the ovary. And so now you've got the this bulging, huge, it's what like we call a, it's mature like a, follicle. It's like a, uh, a white pimple. Yeah, and that's you what know. it's doing. Well, yeah, and it, I think even the term is referred to as nipple. Like it, it, it protrudes from the wall of the ovary like it's trying to escape and pop out like yeah. a pimple. It's weakening because of the theca cells, which is the most outer external l- layer of this whole follicle. The proteolytic enzymes are starting to eat away and it's quite vascularized around that area as well until ultimately it pops out the oocyte from inside. Remember the oocyte, the egg is sitting right But also in the with the follicular cells around it. With the follicular cells. Not around. all of them, but that's right. there's a group that go with it. Something that we haven't mentioned is that surrounding the oocyte Throughout this process of maturation from 0 to 14, it's developed what's called a zona pellucida, which is the security system <laughs> of the egg, right? The so wall, the wall. Basically when, um, when the sperm, you know, you, you're going to have millions of sperm make it to that oocyte at the uterine tube. Once the first one gets in, it's like someone's just broken into your house. You go, the, it st- triggers the alarm system. The screen's shut, the door's bolt shut, everything closes off, no more sperm can get in. And that's the role of the zona pellucida. Yeah. I but, mean, one of them, but yes. Well, yeah. So now this egg is ovulated because of luteinizing hormone predominantly at day 14. So ovulation tends to happen at day 14. Now this egg has been released from the ovary. I think but what al- happens? Also at that point, all those chemicals that you spoke about of the pimple about to pop mm. would also stimulate the frembrae of the um, uterine tube. Yeah to through chemotaxis to kind of go and start to massage the pimple. Yeah. And so that then allows the to take it up to kind of like a suction app action to mm. pull it up into the uh, uterine tube. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now the fimbrae have sort of captured the oocyte with some of those follicle cells and have started to bring it into the uterine tube. What's left over in the ovary again, around day 14-ish, is basically this empty body yellow, of follicle cells. A yellow body. Yes. And so what happens here is that these granulosa cells and theca cells, they no longer need to nourish the oocyte because it's gone. So they start to produce huge amounts of estrogen and predominantly in this case, progesterone. And so this further stimulates the endometrium to continue to thicken and develop and become vascularized for implantation. If we use Dr. Najib's analogy as to what this empty body, now called the corpus luteum, does, so think about it like this, the luteinizing hormone, lutein means yellow, luteinizing means to make something yellow, the LH, which stimulated ovulation, also acts upon the corpus luteum to make it, to stimulate it further and say, hey, start producing more progesterone, yep. which derives from cholesterol and it has a yellow coloration to yeah. it, right? So to make it yellow. Now, Dr. Najib, the OG, right? Original gangster. Just, okay. You know, okay. Or the goat. We can call him the goat, even though he's not a goat. He's definitely a uh, human being. Um, what he says in this case is that the egg being ovulated is like saying goodbye to your kids when they go to university. And you say, look, I know you're going off on your own, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you enough money for 10 days, right? But you have to call me before the end of those 10 days to tell me everything's okay. And if you do, I'll continue to give you money. If you don't call me, I'm cutting you off. Cutting ties. Right? So We're finished. So what will happen is the egg's ovulated. It's in the uterine tube. And the corpus luteum, that body that was surrounding the egg, that's now yellow, producing huge amounts of progesterone, the progesterone is the money that it's giving. Mm -hmm. Now, it's saying, I'm going to keep releasing progesterone for 10 days, around about to day 24, which will continue to nourish the endometrium. If that egg does not 
become fertilised and implant, i.e. make the phone call. It's probably better rather than going to the, to the child to go to the um, accommodation. Well, uh, let's finish the analogy first before you confuse both me and the listener. So the egg, if it does get fertilised and implants, that's the phone call it makes to the corpus luteum and says, yeah, keep releasing progesterone, everything's all good. But if the egg doesn't get fertilised and, Im- and implants and basically just gets passed through um, because of lack of implantation, there's no phone call back to the corpus luteum. And after 10 days it goes, I didn't hear from you, no more progesterone, we're done. Yeah. And so without now, again, day 24 to 25, 26-ish, without the implantation occurring and the call back to the corpus luteum, the estrogen and progesterone plummet. So by the time you hit, if there's no fertilisation and implantation, this is what we're referring to, which is probably what's going to happen predominantly for most people for most of their reproductive years, um, the progesterone and estrogen levels start to plummet at around about day 26-ish, right? And by the time day 28 occurs, the progesterone and estrogen levels are going to be basically at their lowest. Without those stimuli to tell the uh, endometrium of the uterus to grow and divide, that tissue basically dies off mm. and it sloughs away. That's the term that's used, slough, S-L-O-U-G-H, sloughs away and that's the bleeding process that so occurs. that's the that's- functional layer of the endometrium. Yeah, it's, it's endometrial tissue that's being passed blood through. Blood vessels, a lot of blood. Yes, and that's why the, the, it doesn't look necessarily, I mean, there, there is blood that's present, but it's not just blood itself. Mm. There is tissue that, that's present. And so that beginning of the bleeding, which happens at the end of day 28, that signifies day one of the next cycle. cycle yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And so we've gone through... Estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and the ovulation of that egg taken into the uterus. But now, this egg, if a sperm does come along that fertilizes it, that egg can then be taken through the uterus and implanted into the endometrium. What happens from there? Yeah, so if there was a successful fertilization, which, as we said much earlier on today, it takes place usually in the what part of the uterine tube? Uh, the infundibulum. Am, ampulla. Oh, the ampulla. Oh, I said infundibulum, and you corrected me last time. I think so, it's just because I like that term. So at this at this point, as it's moving down towards the uterus, it's just all it's because the the egg has gone through its second phase of meiosis. Yep. And the genetic material from the sperm has been put into the cytoplasm. Yep. And the the two genetic materials are being combined. Now we have a zygote, which is a, a single cell embryo. Yes. So at this point, all that happens is we go through mitosis. So we just copy that one cell into two, yeah. two into four, four into eight. It's just creating daughter cells, basically. That's right. So, and as this is happening, it's going along the flo- uterine tube until it gets close to the uterus. And at that, at that point, as it's getting pretty close, this is where we start to see the changes take place. So oh, what, it's set- around about 32 cells now? Probably right, yep. Which is now a blastocyst? Well, now it's now become a blastocyst, cyst because it looks like it's fluid-filled. Okay. And so the every time these cells go through mitosis, because the zona pellucida, which is that outer hard covering, mm. doesn't allow the fertilised egg to get bitter, bigger. Mm. So that means each cell that's copied actually makes the cell smaller and smaller. Right, right, okay? right, right. So as it gets close to the uterus we see this differentiation into two parts. We have this outer rim around that's kind of lined all the way around the zona pellucida, which yep. is the outer cell mass, and then you have a big blob in the middle called the inner cell mass. Okay. So the inner cell mass will become the embryo. The outer cell mass will become the placenta. Right. Okay. Now, as it's moving into the uterus, where what day are we talking here? We're probably talking... What do you reckon? Day 18, day 18. Okay. Maybe a bit f- day 20. Yep. We're in the phase, what phase of the uterus are we in? Are you saying in? day 20 after ovulation? Oh, just of the cycle. Well, after? Of the cycle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Of the next cycle. No, the current cycle of the ovulation. So day 14 is where the egg gets popped out. Yeah. Gets fertilised day, let's say day 15. Gotcha. So yep. about five days from that, so about day 20, yep. it's now entering the uterus. Now the uterus is currently in what phase? 
by day 20. Yeah. Oh, it's in the luteal phase. So it's that, that's, a whole bunch that's of the pressure. ovary phase, but oh, the, the say, uterus the, phase. Oh, the uterus is in the proliferative phase. It's, it's no, it's secretory. Some, we're, we're now in the oh. secretory phase, which means that the uterus is producing secretions. Like? Okay. Well, there's certain enzymes, but yep. probably mucus as well. Yeah. Now, the enzymes that it's producing will start to break down the zona pellucida. Gotcha. So that outer hard covering is starting to d- diminish and break down. So now we're just, instead of having a clump of cells with a, ha- a hard outer connected tissue barrier, now it's just a clump of cells. Yep. And so the outer cell mass starts to go and lodge into the endometrium. Mm-hmm. And so this is now going to cause these outer cell mass to change name into a, a cytotrophoblast trophoblast yep. and they start to grow into the endometrium and that's going to start to develop the placenta. Yep. These cells, the trophoblast and the syncytia trophoblast will start to produce a very important hormone which is the phone call back. Right. Which is the HCG or yep. the human chironic gonadotrophin. gonadotrophin. Yep. So this is the important signal. So this is where it's coming from the frat house or the accommodation. Yep. They're calling back and telling the parent, yeah, they've arrived Keep setting the money. So it's pretending to be a gonadotropin release from the hypothalamus? Yeah. Or from the anterior pituitary? Kind of, yeah, yeah. that's right. And so this HCG plays some important roles. Um, one, maintaining pregnancy because yep. progesterone is to progestate, yep. to maintain gestation. But it's also going to inform the mother or the parents-to-be that they're pregnant yep. because that's the, your pee on the stick Right. Test. Yep. You look for HCG. Yeah. HCG is because it won't be there without a placenta. Correct. Or not. Yeah. Yeah. An early placenta. Yeah. Um, HCG also plays a, a role in the chemotactic trigger zone in your brainstem, which gives you morning sickness. Oof. Okay. So that is the reason for why that hormone is one of the reasons for why women get morning sickness. Yep. So it makes that part of your brain more sensitive. Didn't they used to? take women's urine and, and squirt it onto frogs and if the frogs got pregnant, that indicated that the woman was pregnant? I don't, think, I don't was, think it'll make the frog pregnant. Maybe it makes a, the frog ovulate maybe. But yeah, that's what – well, okay, I didn't mean <laughs> – yeah, sorry. That's what I meant. I, that's what I meant. I'm uh, Not pregnant. Ovulate because when a frog ovulates, it lays eggs and they're not fertilised eggs. Right? Yeah. So okay. – <laughs> That's what I meant. I'm not could, saying that could be. humans are making. I, I have uh, heard that before. I have heard yeah, that. Yeah, look, I, I'm sure that I've got that wrong, but no, there's have, something I, about I, that. I've heard that. Uh, HCG also has, and it's again happened with my wife. My wife has had a number of challenges in pregnancy. Yeah. Um, the HCG also acts as, I think, almost like a thyroid stimulating hormone. Yeah. And it causes hypothyroidism. Okay. So she developed in both pregnancies, hypothyroidism and really bad morning sickness. Right. Probably just because of her sensitivity to the HCG. Yeah. And so she needed to be probably for the first 20 weeks, from about probably week six to week 20 on a Dancertron. Maxilon didn't work. That's a long time of being mm. sick. Poor thing. But terribly sick, like yeah. just constantly vomiting. Ugh. And so she also had hypothyroidism. Yeah, anyway. Wow. So that's HCG. And so, yeah, it was what we said. So it seemed to be in the mid-1900s, so 1950s-ish, I assume, the African clawed frog, Xenopus lavis, was used for pregnancy tests. Uh, they injected a woman's urine into the female frog, monitored its response. The presence of the HCG in a woman's urine would induce ovulation of the frog, causing it to release its eggs, telling you that you're pregnant. Wow. I mean, I don't think the... It was a home test. I don't think you ordered the frogs and did it yourself. Just turn up the mail. I think you would send it off to uh, to the doctor. Which and doctor? <laughs> I was going to answer that and say, you GP, but I see what you mean now. Um, <laughs> so uh, what are we up to? Are we, we're nearly done. Yeah. So I think the, the last thing just to add, oh, well, we could just say, look, once – so. Th- You've spoke about this cycle happens from about the age of 11 all the way through to late 40s and then we go into it or women go through a phase called a perimenopause. Oh, yes. yes, Which is just less frequent. So instead of having this happen every month, it starts to diminish. And I think it's due to the reduction in 
available eggs. Available follicles. Because you'll end up, um, uh, a, a woman will end up creating probably four to 500 mature follicles in their reproductive lifetime. So, so that, that's you mean all ovul- the eggs. ovulated ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you didn't mention that, but we should just say that, that what they call is a graphene follicle. Yeah, all the mature, mature follicle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so around about four to 500 of them. Um, and so once the eggs are exhausted um, and there's not enough or none available and they hit that a uh, that whatever that age may be it's going to be different for, for everybody but probably around late 40s early 50s ish and this could be this perimenopause could be anywhere from 5 to 10 years yeah, in duration yeah because yeah, if it slows down yeah. and you've got f- fewer remaining then obviously you you're still going to menstruate but just it's going to be delayed and you know the periods will be different uh it, when I say periods, I mean the period of time between yeah. each menstrual cycle. I and I think because say. there's less follicles, there's less the production of those uh, estrogen and progesterone. Yes. But they still have the same amount or the same functioning of the FSH, LH um, secretion. Mm. So because there's no negative feedback, the FSH and LH become a higher yes. amount secreted. And the estrogen and, are lower. And it's thought that the reason for some of the symptoms associated with perimenopause and menopause like um, Fla- flushes, flushes and night sweats is due to the possibility of high amounts of LH. Yeah, yeah. And I think another important point is once um, uh, menopause occurs and you've got very low levels of estrogen and progest- progesterone, because they're both anabolic hormones, you can have problems with uh, bone density. For yeah. That's a bigger one, a bone density. So without the inhibitory effect of estrogen stopping osteoclasts, which break down the bone, osteoclasts start to become more abundant and break the bone down and it increases the risk of osteoporosis. Yes. But also, you know, reduces protein synthesis. Again, they're anabolic. So, uh, and hence and then, why and some women will go on hormone replacement therapy yep. for this purpose. And then the... The risk of cardiovascular disease that women catch up to men very quickly at this point now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the estrogen reduction, estrogen amount is loses the protective effect on the cardiovascular system. I think uh, another point I want to add is the contraceptive pill, and so the contra the female contraceptive pill works at least currently and predominantly by been taking it it's taken at a particular time where the pill releases predominantly estrogen and or it could be both it could estrogen be estrogen progesterone but predominantly what's happening is that it's releasing it at a certain time in the cycle at a certain level and it's maintaining so remember throughout this whole cycle uh, hormones are fluctuating right they're going up and down up and down and every time it goes up and down something different so something different occurs if you're maintaining estrogen levels and progesterone levels at a certain level that's r- maintained and relatively low, that will have an inhibitory effect on the hypothalamus, saying don't release gonadotropin, so don't release LH and FSH. If FSH isn't released early on, the follicles aren't selected for. So you don't have that one big follicle that's, that gets selected for, and without the LH you don't get the ovulation, and so you, base, you, you don't get um, the selected follicle for ovulation, Mm -hmm. right? And so hence why it's used as a contraceptive means. But it also means that you don't get the natural uh, cycle of hormones that would occur through every menstrual cycle. Uh, And that in itself may have varying effects on individuals. So anytime you play around with hormone levels, there's there will be down. There can be. I shouldn't say will. There can be downstream effects of those. Mm. Um, and some people can't use the contraceptive pill because of various effects that it can have because of hormones and hormone yeah. levels. And I think and they they even use the pill sometimes to normalise periods. So they yes can put a female onto a pill to make her uh, cycle more regular. Let's yeah. say so yeah. closer to the twenty eight day. Yeah. What else? Oh, just really quickly, the embryology, I think. Okay. So, again, thanks, everyone. Um, this, this is, is pretty t- much all you need to listen to. You and, can leave uh, now yeah. or you can choose to sit on. Okay. Well, look, if you decide to stay, uh, we will be doing <laughs> listener mail at the end of this episode. That might keep you all there. All right, Matt, uh, you go do embryology. I'll, I'll do it very I'm quickly. I'm just going to go to... So, 
Let's go back to All the right. implantation. Yes. So as I said, the outer cell mass becomes the placenta, which is important for the HCG yep. maintaining pregnancy. But the inner cell mass is going to be important as well because that's going to make the baby. <laughs> oh, that's pretty important. <laughs> so those cluster of cells will kind of I'll, – I'll do this really quickly – will go from a big blob. Well, it doesn't mean you have to say it quickly. Yeah. You just you just have to uh, – the economy of words. Okay. Matt, I'm not good at that. Words. I'm not good at that. All right. So that blob of cells, the inner cell mass or the embryoblast, yeah. will then start to stratify into three uh, disks or three layers. Right. And they're going to be called the epiblast, or actually, no, the ectoderm. <laughs> well, the epiblast was <laughs> the first one, epiblast and the hyperblast, but now we're going to have the ectoderm, which will form the outer covering of the embryo, right. but also going to make the central nervous system. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have the endoderm, which is the bottom layer, that's going to make the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. And then all the stuff in, in between mesoderm. is the mesoderm. And that makes what? <laughs> Everything between the skin and the gut. So okay. A lot of the, the body, the bones, the connective tissue, the muscles. Of so, so pre-baby, you're three layers. Yeah. And At three weeks. Endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm going from in to out, inside right. to outside. Okay, now what? So develop the genital system, which is why I'm bringing this up. Mm -hmm. So how do we develop all those anatomical structures that we spoke about in the female? Sure, yeah. Okay. It starts from a particular type of mesoderm called the intermediate mesoderm. Now, right. to picture where it is, if you were to remove... If at you what were, point? In ge week just four. Week okay, four. Okay. So if you were to look at the inner part of the abdominal... Yeah, say the abdominal cavity. So if you pulled out all your intestines... Yep. And you would look into the abdominal cavity. Yeah. What you would see in the midline, and this is for us as an adult, you would just have the vertebral column, right? Yeah. That's that's the midline. That's the back of the abdominal cavity. But on either side of it, there would have been in the embryo a structure called the intermediate mesoderm, okay. which is just a, a big long ridge. Will we have a picture of this on the YouTube channel? We can do that. Okay. Yeah. Running down either side of the developing vertebra. All right. Okay. Happy with that so far? Happy. This is the intermediate mesoderm. Yeah. Now, this structure will end up making the urinary tract, so it's going to make the kidney, mm -hmm. but it's also going to start the undifferentiated gonad. So you'll have a region there called the gonad ridge, I think. So can, can I just interject and say, is this an identical process regardless of male, female? Correct. Okay. It's an undifferentiated gonad at this point, which means it hasn't been told which way to go. Okay. Okay. Now, there's a group of cells a bit further downstream that kind of come from the gut area that these are known as the primordial germ cells, which are going to be either the oogonia. Yeah, or the spermatogonia. Right. So they have to go migrate. Are they, so they're, mesen, they're, they're um, mesoderm or originated cells? Um, that's a good question. Oh, stumped you. Yeah, stumped me. Sorry. I oh. don't know what their derivative was. Okay. That's Presumably good. endoderm, right. but I'm happy to be con uh, corrected. corrected. Don't worry. No one's so listening, the, so no one's going to correct <laughs> it. So they migrate until they have to find that gonad. Yeah. Now, as they go into the gonad, these germal-like cells, what they will start to do, if it is a genetic male sex where there's a y, y chromosome, yep. a gene will be expressed called the SRY gene, yes, yes. the sex-determinating gene, yep. and that will start to turn on a testy-determining factor. Okay. Okay. So what that will do is start to produce... Well, first of all, what that SRY gene will now differentiate the gonad. So now we, if that is present, it will go down a testy-like line. Okay. So the gonad would now differentiate into a testy like structure. Sure. Where if it's absent, it will become an ovary like. So the default ovary. That's right. Yep. And so this just determines the internal structure of the gonad at this point. So okay. it's instead of the male testy, which develops in these nice log lobules with yep. these ducts for the ovary, quack, quack. The, with the ovary, it's just scattered throughout. So what all, is scattered throughout? all these um, germal cells. Oh, gotcha, so gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. There's yep. no regular pattern. It's just throughout the whole gonad. So these primordial oogonia yep. are just dispersed throughout this early ovary. That's correct. Right. But for the male, they're going to be punctated within particular designated lobules of the early testy. Correct. All right. 
So, See, so that's I the, can do. I can do embryology. So that, that gonad at, at this point in time is kind of in the lower thoracic, upper lumbar region of the embryo. It's pretty high. Okay. So where the it's kidneys are. It's pretty high. Yeah, up to with the kidneys. The kidneys yeah. are on their already gone the descended. They're already moved down. Right. So they're already ahead of. Ahead so my of, ahead kidneys of them. descended before my testes. That's did. right. That's right. <laughs> now next to the gonad, you had a, you have two ducts. You have a mesonephric. Mallard. Oh, yeah. A mesonephric duct. Okay. Mesonephric. Okay, which is yeah. right next to the gonad. Yeah. And then next to that is the uh, paramesonephric duct, okay. which is parallel to the mesonephric duct. We're really getting into the embryological yeah. weeds here, aren't we? Well, the, t- the other term you could use is for the mesonephric duct. You could call it the wolfian duct. Okay. Okay. Which I'll use now, the wolfian. Okay, like that's the, the wolf. mesonephric. I go, Ooh. Okay. okay, don't do that well, ever again. <laughs> wolfian duct. And next to that one is the malarian duct. This would be a better term to use. Okay. Okay. So again, now these two the, duct what's system. What's the difference between the wolfie and the malaria? Nothing at this point. Okay. But regardless of male and female, they're they're there. They're two pipes running next to each other. Okay. Pipe systems that are going down, and they're going to drain into the cloaca. Wait a minute. Are you just telling me I've got a cloaca? Not what well, you do at this point of five weeks. Right. But not now. Not now. Hopefully not now. Okay. Okay. Unless you're a bird. All right. Or, yeah, a bird or maybe other animals. So there's two duct systems running on either side of the gonad. And mm-hmm. Remember, there's two gonads, so you got on one right of the side of the, bo- the right side of the body, and left side of the body. Yes. Okay. Two pipes either side. Those two pipes, malarian duct, uh, wolfian duct, are running down into the cloaca, which so is going. Two, so you got two of those either side. That's right. Oh. Now we've already differentiated the gonad into a testy or an ovary. That's right. done by the SRY gene. Yep. Yeah. Now what happens are the supportive cells around it. Now, okay. for the, f- the female or the ovary, that would be the follicular cells. Okay. Okay. But if it's differentiated down the male lineage, these will become the Leydig oh, and, the, and Sertoli. the Sertoli. Nice. So the Leydig will then start, to, at this point, start to produce testosterone. Yep. Testosterone will select for the wolf induct. So it okay. will say, pipe next to me, you stay there. Yeah. While the Sertoli cells produces an inhibitory factor called MIF or malarian inhibiting factor, yep. which tells the pipe further away, degenerate, please. Right. So it selects the wolfian, degenerates the malarian. Right. So you've now got testes with wolfian duct. Correct. And the wolfian duct grabs it. So the wolfian duct where it kind of grabs onto the testy. Is that the epididymis? Epididymis. Okay. Perfect. And there's a big long ligament that's attached to it called yeah. the gubernaculum. Wonderful term. That will pull the testes all the way down through the abdomen wall into the scrotum. Into the scrotum. What happens to the gubernaculum? It degenerates into, I think, there's a, there's a remnant structure. Okay. Now, we're doing testes. female reproductive yeah, system right. here. So, so for, the, for the female, none of this happens. So there's no testosterone yeah. and there's no malarian inhibitory factor. No Leydig cells, no Sertoli cells for the selection. Correct. So what happens by default? So by default, because there's estrogen being produced, that it will feminize this process. So because there's no, no testosterone, the wolf induct won't be selected for, so it will degenerate. Right. And because there's no inhibiting factor, the malarian inhibiting factor from the Sertoli cell, right. the, the malarian duct will stay in place. So basically, wolfian must be selected for and mal- malarian must be inhibited but Correct. without either of those stimuli, wolfian will degenerate by default That's right. and malarian will be selected by default. Correct. What now happens with the malarian? How does it interact with the... Very ovary? similar. So the malarian ductal system will be also located fairly close and so the, the broader outer part, which looks like the end of the trumpet, mm. that will be Fimbra. the frimbrae and then the infundibulin and then you've got the isthmus. But right down the bottom end of it, it will start to develop into the uterus. Oh, so it just pouches out to become the uterus. Yeah, that's right. So the malarian is and cervix? The top part of the cervix. But, but then the, the lower part of the cloaca will develop into the lower part of the vagina and the vestibule. And so the... So there is a segregation yeah, between a segregation. the cervix and the vagina? Yeah. Embryologically? Embryologically, yeah. Yeah. And so... And then the same thing happens. So there's, can I just there's still a gubernaculum. Okay, okay. And I'll it's, interrupt in a sec. It's going to pull the ovary down. Okay. But it doesn't pull it all the way to the scrotum. No. It stops. And so it 
will kind of pause. Because it started the, up at the kidneys. Same as the male, yeah. but it pulls it down into the pelvis oh. and stops. And this is going to now develop as two ligaments. So you have your ovarian ligament and the round ligament. And the round ligament is going to still go all the way down to the scrotal mm-hmm. equivalent, which is the labia majora. Right. And so there's still that ligament, which is the gubernaculum remnant yeah, in the okay. female. Okay. Well, it got interesting. Yeah. Question, uh, hysterectomy, because a hysterectomy is the removal, generally speaking, of the ovary, the uterine tubes in the uterus, um, is that basically just a malarian, remo- malarian removal? Well, it would be a malarian removal plus the gonad. Plus the gonad. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then this, look, you, you and then the external genitalia. Yeah. They would all, go through that too. Uh, basically, uh, we kind of went through it when we had the terms at the front. Mm-hmm. In the early fetal period, you have the opening of the cloaca, which would be the basically the urogenital sinus. Yep. And then you have these kind of folds that start to develop on either side of that sinus. And that is then influenced by testosterone or estrogen. I think all people want to know is what is the analogous structure, male, female? So for the glands, which would glands have been... Glands penis, which is the, the glands, penis. The glands area, yep. the way that when it's feminized, it'll become the clitoris. Yep. When it's masculinized, it'll become the glands penis. Yep. The... Um, the urogenital folds will kind of become the labia minora and if the male, the raphae, yep. I guess you'd say. Yep. The scrotal swellings will become the scrotum and the female, it will become the labia majora. Yep. And as I said, the urogenital sinus in the male will close up and the only part that remains open is the end part of the glans penis yep. that remains open. For the female, it's kind of two parts that remain open, the vagina and the external urethral orifice. So it becomes the vestibule. Well, the, the vestibule is kind of the space. Surrounding and surrounding encompassing. Yeah. yeah. Matt, are we done? Yeah. All and, right. and I guess the only thing I'll say there oh, okay. is because you can see all the intricacies of all these hormones, all these inhibitory factors, all yeah. these things, if things don't kind of coordinate perfectly, you can see how these ductal systems won't either degenerate oh, embryologically. or yeah. yeah. And then there's going to be um, impact with things like the testes descend in yep. or even if there's they become not responsive to the hormones, mm-hmm. the way that the gonad may differentiate. And so it's very complex. Yes. Uh, there is, and, and this is, I think, an important point, uh, which I, I tried to articulate at the beginning but probably didn't do it very well, um, is that while we're talking about a textbook version of female reproductive system and male reproductive system, you, you, there's everything in between, right? Yes. And, and while probably the majority of individuals will develop in one way or the other way, there's everything in between because everyone's different and hormone levels, um, uh, growth hormone levels, not sorry, growth hormone levels, um, growth factors, all these processes that happen embryologically all the way through to puberty and adulthood influence the way that these structures present and there is significant variation amongst all of us. And so I think that's an important with, point with, it, with all anatomy, we're like that, right? There's well, exactly. The reprodu- why would the reproductive system be any different? Anatomy is just a generalised um, approach to try to understand the body, really. Yes. Look, if, if, if we spoke about all possible variations... We'd be here all... Yeah, well, we be, actually would never finish. It'd be a 20-hour <laughs> podcast. So... You know, please forgive us uh, for for talking about very generic, broad, um, you know, summaries or overviews of each of these systems. Because uh, honestly, with the with the time frame, it's the best that we can we can do. So uh, that is the female reproductive system. It is time, Matthew, for listener mail. We're still waiting for um, a listener to send us a uh, tune for our. Listener mail. Oh, yeah, we need to listen to mail tune. What's going on? What's going on, everyone? Bloody hell. So if you can come up with a little enough. jingle, a little tune, we will appreciate it. We can, we can slot it in now a and we ditty. can play it and it will sound much better than Mike talking. Oh, whatever. Um, okay, so. I've got an email from Binu. Yep. And so Binu says, oh, hi, I'm a nurse currently doing a non-medical prescribing course. 
I love your videos. Um, your teaching is simple and easy. Um, can you make some videos on pharmacology, basic pharmacology? YouTube videos. Okay. Yeah, we've got a couple up there. We've got a number. It's it's not necessarily you and I talking. It's uh, it's one made by a PhD student. No, I I talk. I narrate on it, but I didn't That's produce true. the, yes. um, the um, animations. But yeah, look, give us. I mean, there's so many drugs uh, and and uh, meds. Let us know what ones do you want us to cover. Uh, be aware, and I'm going to say this because uh, I think it's important. Is that you know we've got very limited time. And the time that we spend to create content must be content that's probably broadly applicable to many health students. So you'll probably find that we don't really do obscure, uncommon drugs or diseases uh, because the amount, well, one, it would actually take a long time to prepare for, which we don't have, and two, it's not for a larger audience. So if there are common drugs that you'd like us to cover, let us know. Happy to do that. Absolutely. Uh, I have an email from uh, Dana Gomez, and the subject is just thank you. So firstly, it says, hey there, how are you? First of all, sorry about my English. That's not a problem. It's been a long time since I wrote this much. Uh, I'm Dana, 25, from Argentina. Oh, brilliant. Uh, I studied biomedical engineering at National University of Cordoba. How cool. And as you can guess, I do have a lot of medical subjects during uh, that study. One of them is human physiology, which I'm taking right now. Awesome. That's my... uh That's my area. Bag. That's my bag. About a month ago, I found you guys on Spotify because I've been listening to podcasts while I was at the gym or walking or cooking to get the contents of the lessons. There's so much information to assimilate. And sometimes I think uh, that the hours of the day are not enough. Believe me, uh, I agree and our students do too. Uh, Between this subject and others I'm taking, I have my weeks very divided with studying times. Um, The second is... uh, The more I listen to you, the more I want to learn and go deeper. Oh, thank you very much. Um, So I looked you up on YouTube and social media, and all I'm going to say is that my notes have changed a lot since you entered in my study life. Oh, that's really nice. Uh, My friends sometimes hate me in a good way because they are all in English uh, and only the class notes are in Spanish. But, oh, my God, you are very good at this. Uh, You truly are. This is awesome. Uh, I can't translate everything because of the way you explain it so much easier. Uh, once I completely understand, I'll try very hard to transmit them uh, thanks to the podcast, uh, which is awesome. Very um, nice. Yeah. So uh, just a big thank you from Dana uh, and a big thank you from us to you, Dana. Thank you so much for contacting you, us. We love these types of emails. So this email's from Omkar. Omkar, the subject of this email was birthday wish from Western Sydney University. Oh, okay. And so, you used to go there, didn't that's you? That's right. Okay. So it says, hi, Dr. Mike, Dr. Mike and Dr. Matt. It should be the other way around. Anyway, Dr. Mike, Dr. Matt. I come Matt, first. I come first. Absolute huge fan and of the content you put out. Cool. I'm currently a first year medical student at Western Sydney University and your videos and podcasts have been so, so useful. My friend is possibly your biggest fan, admirer, <laughs> and his birthday is coming up very soon. Is it possible for you to do a shout out? His name is uh, Addy. Addy. Addy? Let's have a look because I know that you're not very good with pronouncing anything. A-D-I. What does it say that? Yes, Addy. Happy 20th birthday. So can you sing happy birthday, Mark? Sure. Should I sing it uh, the way that Marilyn Monroe sang it to JFK? <laughs> sure. Happy birthday. No, okay. Ready? We'll both sing it together. Happy Ready? birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Addy. Happy birthday, 20th, 20th birthday, 20th birthday, 20th birthday, to, birthday. to you. Good Woo-hoo. luck with your medical studies. So that's Western Sydney. I used to teach there where well, they said, P.S., a lot of PBL tutors here work, said they used to work with Matt. Huge respect. Huge respect? Yeah. That's surprising. That's right. It's very surprising. Huge respect because he left. (laughs) That's right. They're very grateful that Matt left. So uh, five years at Western Sydney University, so good luck all students there. That's awesome. Yes. Shout out to Western Sydney Uni and Addy. Uh, I've got one from Danielle. Uh, The subject is child health topics. Hello. I love your videos and we promote them throughout our curriculum for nursing students. Oh, thanks, Danielle. Uh, Danielle's from Plymouth. Cool. I think I went to Plymouth. Didn't I go visit Plymouth when I went uh, was that, that conference? That wasn't Southampton. Oh, it was East Anglia. Uh, I don't know the difference between 
Plymouth and East Anglia. My apologies. I'll figure that one out very shortly. But wondering if you know of resources around the differing anatomical and physiological differences from infancy to adulthood. There is a handful of good books but struggling to find videos. Well, Danielle, this is the reproductive, uh, female reproductive. So we spoke a little bit about development but probably more so reproductive development as opposed to more uh, gross uh, developmental changes that occur from childhood to adulthood. Mm. Um, do you know any good developmental textbooks that sort of show the processes? Because most textbooks are adults. Mm. They'll, they'll show very s- small aspects of childhood and then goes to adulthood. But do you know anything that sort of shows the whole gamut of... Not from the top of my head, no. Uh, no, neither do I. That's a good point, Danielle. Um, we don't. Maybe you should write one. And if you do... We'll promote it on the podcast. There we go. Thank you, Danielle. This one's from Moses and the subject is biochemistry two. Yep. And Moses asks, can you please make a tutorial on the biosynthesis of the 20 amino acids? You'd be great at that, Mike. It shall be done. Yeah, I'll do it. I need to do more biochemistry stuff. I need to, uh, I used to know it all uh, and now I've forgotten it all. But I will We did say that in the last podcast, I think when we did the buffers. Yeah. We spoke about amino acids. We did. And we, we did at one point memorise the whole 20 yeah. structurally. Yeah. But I've forgotten them. Yeah, of course I've forgotten them. I've got an email here from Sherry Hardy. Thank you, says the subject. I'm an older student. I just started nursing school this June at 43. That's not old. And I haven't been to school since I was 17 years old. Okay, that's a big difference though there. So studying's going to be a whole new thing for you. The YouTube videos and podcasts have greatly enhanced my success in AMP and all the classes that it rolls over into. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, I am coming from a basis of never having taken any classes like this. Yeah, that would be tricky. Um, and the way that you break things down and turn it into a discussion rather than just putting it straight out facts greatly increases my understanding of the information and helps with application. Thank you. Uh, P.S. I just finished the endocrine podcast and wanted to add, I'm from the St. Louis MO area in the USA. What's MO? St. Louis, Minnesota? No, St. Louis. What? This is how bad our international knowledge is. Um, let's have a look. Uh, I, think, I think Minnesota. That's, uh, I'm just having a look what state MO is. Uh, Missouri. 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 Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. St. Saint- Louis? Because there's a St. Louis and a St. Louis, isn't there? Sherry, you're going to have to email <laughs> us again. Is it St. <laughs> Louis or is it St. Louis in Minnesota? Have you been to Minnesota? No. I'd like to go to Minnesota. I think it's on the heard Great Lakes. Yeah, I heard it's beautiful there. Uh, thank you so much, Sherry. We really appreciate it. And best of luck with all of your study. Do you have another email? Last one. All right. This is from Janine and she says, thank you from SA, which I think is South Africa. South Australia. No, this is South Africa. Okay. Hi. During the heart of COVID-19 lockdown. Why are you reading it like that? This is how it was stated. (laughs) Um, With a new baby and a busy five-year-old, I decided to make a change and try to get into med school. Without giving my age away, I'm an 80s baby. Anyway. Me too. Apart from feeling slightly insane since (laughs) that's not really my point, I really want to give you both a huge thank you for all your incredible content, energy, and the most incredible way that they share and explain the human body. Janine. Thank you, Janine. Um, Keep going. At Wits University in Joburg, so it was South America. My bad. They offer a graduate entry medical program. So if you have any degree, in my case, it was a Bachelor of Psych with honours, and you complete the first year of physics, chemistry, and biology, you can apply, write a test oh, that's cool. to have entry, which covers the second second year of AMP molecular medicine. So today I received notification that I was successful Yay! and passed, and they will consider my application into third year medicine. Without many... That's deserved. That's deserved. That's true. Yes. Very well done, Janine. But you got a little bit more here. Okay. Without many of your videos and easy to listen to podcasts, I would have been at a complete loss. Oh. So thank you. Hopefully they will offer me a spot and I will keep your channels at my fingertips. Although I'll probably still listen to your podcast. Turns out that I'm a bit of an academic nerd. <laughs> Janine. Both of us. Thank you, Janine. Thanks, Janine. And good How nice are these emails? They are nice. They make us feel very, very good. Uh, I mean, this is the reason why we do it. We, uh, we spend our time to create these podcasts uh, and these YouTube videos. Uh, we do it because we care and I like <laughs> listening to myself. Um, 
look, they're fun. And again, if you have any suggestions, please feel free to contact us. You can go to our website and on the website, you can access our email and ask us questions. Uh, we're in the process of changing the email. It won't matter for you at the moment, but uh, you can email us directly, gubiosciences at gmail.com, uh, or you can email us on uh, Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike at Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike. Oh, see, now I've buggered it up. I'll just you can email do it through the website. There's a, a yeah, section where you can contact us. I've created a new email address and I can't remember it. So just something at Gmail. go to the website, which is drmattdrmike.com.au. I repeat, D-R-M-A-T-T-D-R-M-I-K-E.com.au. Go there, send us an email. Tell us how much uh, you... Uh, appreciate Mike, appreciate not Matt. Appreciate me, hate Matt, and, you know, and how much you would like it just to be... I think like you said on Twitter... The Dr. You- Mike podcast. And replace Matt with AI. Yeah, well, it would definitely have more personality. <laughs> Matthew, thank you. That's Everyone, thank you so much. Sad but true. My See favorite yeah. Metallica song. <laughs>Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.